Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Good morning, Radiant Church. My name is Mike, and I'm happy to open the scriptures with you today. We're in a series we're calling Remain in Him from John chapter 13 through 17, looking at Jesus' final uh, talk with his disciples before he goes to the cross. So he's giving them these words in a time of transition and trial, and they're very uh, important for us to hear today as we are in the midst of transitions and trials. Danny did a great job last week talking about how Jesus serves us as he washes his disciples' feet, showing them how what love looks like, even washing the feet of the one who would betray him. And that's where we're picking up the story. We're going to look today at Judas's betrayal of Jesus and how Judas responds to that. And also Peter. P- Peter's predicted to b- deny Christ and how Peter responds to that. And on the surface, they look very similar. They both fail and deny Christ, but end up in way different places. And as we'll see, failure ruins those who don't know their identity in Christ. But failure shapes those who do know their identity in Christ. So we're going to see that we can remain in Christ even through failure. So we'll pick up the story in chapter 13, starting at verse 18. So uh, Jesus says, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. And then skipping to verse 36, Simon Peter said to Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. So, Relating this story to our day, Judas is a picture of a person who goes to church, is among the crowd, maybe has Christian friends, is even perhaps a part of the leadership, and all the while underneath the surface has ulterior motives, maybe secret sins, insincere faith, right? So Judas is a part of the crowd, but is revealed to be one who does not love and worship Christ. Peter is the picture of a sincere believer in Christ who fails. So on the surface, yes, they both fail, but they end up in way different places as we will see. So we'll start with Judas. So like we just read, uh, Jesus predicts that Judas will betray him. And Judas, now it was, like I said, was a part of the 12, but All the while, there was something a little off with him. Earlier in the book of John, in chapter 12, it says that Judas used to help himself to the money bag. So Judas had 
something going on with money, a love of money, right? That maybe caused him to uh, ultimately d deny Christ. Maybe he was looking for more of a political revolution that Jesus wasn't going along with. Whatever it is, Judas is revealed as one who doesn't ultimately worship Christ. So after he leaves this meal, Judas heads off, is bribed by the religious leaders, and then uh, Jesus and his friends go to the garden, and Judas leads the soldiers to Jesus for him to be arrested. And the way he betrays Jesus is with a kiss. Again, putting on that fake facade, kissing Jesus, looking as if he's a friend of Christ, but ultimately betraying him. In Matthew's gospel, we see that after this, Judas is struck with remorse. He feels terrible. He realizes what he's done, and he's guilt-ridden and feels condemned. And he tries to give the money back, but he ultimately hangs himself. And we, 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 we reflect on this. Paul is writing in 2 Corinthians. He talks about how not all remorse leads to repentance. He says that I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, because of your sorrow but because your sorrow led you to repentance, for you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. But worldly sorrow brings death. And that's where Judas ends up. He feels bad about what he's done, but because he doesn't truly love Christ, uh, his sorrow leads to death. Um, it's important for us to to see the story of Judas betraying Christ because it reveals how important it is that what what we worship is what's most important about us. Obviously, Judas doesn't ultimately worship Christ, and that's revealed in trial and testing. But it's also important for us to take a look because Jesus says that at the end of the age, we will experience betrayal, that brother will betray brother. This is from Matthew 10. Father, his child, child will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So it's good for us to see how Jesus responds to one who betrays him because we will face this kind of betrayals. People that we thought were close to us, who we thought were with us, are revealed to not be that. And we see that Jesus loves Judas, washes his feet, pursues him to the end, offers him bread, bring, tries to bring him into the fellowship. So we are to do the same when faced with betrayal. Yes, it will be painful. I'm sure this is the ultimate test of faith to be betrayed by someone you thought was close to you. But we see in Jesus that he loved and served Judas all the way to the end. So I think it'd be good to pause for a minute, maybe pause the video and think about this question. If you're watching this with other people, discuss this. How do you normally respond to failure? How do you normally respond when you fail? When you feel bad about something, do you try to get busy and fix it, cover it up? Do you confess it quickly? What, what's your response to failure? But also what's your normal response when other people around you fail? fail? And I, I think this would be good for us to pay attention how we respond and react to failure. And as we move into the next uh, part of the story, we look at Peter. So Peter tells Jesus, hey, Jesus, I will follow you to the end. I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus says, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And in Luke's account of this story, uh, Jesus tells Peter uh, that Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Not that you won't fail, Peter. Jesus didn't say that you won't fail, but that your faith will not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Satan was moving in on Jesus and his friends, right? Moving in, uh, it says when Judas betrays Jesus that Satan entered him. Satan's also angling to take Peter out. Jesus tells him, Peter, Satan's asked to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith will not fail. So as the story moves along, Jesus is arrested and Peter's hanging back at a distance and watching his trial and people start to recognize Peter and say, hey, you're one of his followers. I've seen you with them. And Peter starts to deny that he even knows Christ. Peter had just said moments earlier, I'll follow you to death. And here he is denying Christ. He's not being threatened with death and he's already denying Jesus. The rooster crows and Peter realizes what he's done. Oh, how humiliated. Peter must have felt in that moment, realizing, man, he was right. I failed. I denied him. It's embarrassing. He feels shameful. 
right? He, he wants to hide. He experiences remorse, similar remorse to Judas. But let's see how Peter responds because the gospel story doesn't end with failure because the, the gospel story doesn't end with Jesus' death. If Jesus' death was the end, that'd be it. But the gospel story shows that Jesus takes on our sins and failures and humiliations and is crushed by them and then is raised to new life, conquers those sins. He conquers death and he returns to restore Peter to himself. And so in chapter 21 in John, we get this interaction with Jesus and Peter. So uh, Jesus is arrested, put on trial, dies and is buried and then is resurrected and starts appearing again to his friends. And I love this chapter because Peter and some of the other disciples head off to fish again. This is their previous occupation. So uh, Peter is probably really thankful that Jesus is alive again, that that wasn't the end of Jesus' story. But we can see that Peter thinks this is the end of his story. He goes back to where he was before Jesus found him and is fishing. So Jesus, in verse 4, we see, just as day was breaking, he stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? I mean, just notice the playfulness of Christ. He's just taken on the sins and failures of the world upon himself and paid the price with his own life and then has been resurrected to new life and has conquered death and sin and judgment. And what does he do? He messes with his friends. He goes and finds them and says, hey guys, you, you caught anything? He's, he doesn't, uh, he's um, hiding his identity. They don't know who he is. And they say, no, we haven't caught anything. He says, try the other side of the boat. So they do and they haul in this huge catch of fish. And it reminds them of an earlier encounter with Jesus when he first called them to himself, where Jesus did the same thing and told them to fish on the other side. And, they, uh, and as they haul in the fish, it says that John, the disciple who Jesus loved, therefore says to Peter, it's the Lord. And I love Peter's reaction. Peter, again, coming off a big failure, says, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in on the boat, dragging the net of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Peter, though he feels the remorse of his failure, when he realizes it's Jesus, he has to be with them. He, have you ever swam fully clothed? It's not easy, yet alone swimming a hundred yards. Peter doesn't care. He's got to get to Jesus. So he swims to shore. And what do they do on the shore but have breakfast together? I mean, just notice just Jesus, the resurrected Lord who's conquered death, is having breakfast with his friends. And after breakfast, he invites Peter on a walk with him on the beach. And this is when Peter is fully restored. And he asks Peter, this is verse 15 of chapter 21, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, um, I don't think that Jesus is asking Peter, do you love me? Because Jesus isn't sure if Peter loves him. Jesus is asking Peter this because Peter is not sure that he loves Jesus. And so Jesus asks him three times for each of his failures and denials. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Imagine the pain this would cause. Now, like if somebody that you are close with or love, maybe a spouse asks you, do you love me? Most of us, certainly I don't respond this way. We don't respond by thinking, oh, great, an opportunity to show how much we love them. I start thinking, why did Katie ask me if I love her? What did I do to cause her to think I don't love her? We get defensive. We start to call to mind the ways we've shown that we love them. So the pain that Peter feels when Jesus looks at him and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Jesus is calling Peter into the pain I like what John Eldridge writes in Wild at Heart. He says, this is the way we are with our wound. We bury it deep and never take it out again. But take it out we must, or better yet, enter into it. This is where our restoration starts. This is where Jesus starts with Peter. He calls him right into the painful place of his wound. Do you love me? But he's also bringing forth a confession of Peter's love. He wants Peter to hear that Peter loves Christ. See, Jesus is restoring Peter in two simple but profound ways. He's restoring him as a lover of God, a lover of Christ, reminding Peter that he is a child of God who is loved and loves God. 
He wants Peter to hear that and say that with his own mouth. Because like I said earlier, failure will ruin those who are not secure and confident in their identity in Christ. But failure will shape those of us who are in Christ. As we remain in Christ through our failure, we are shaped. And Peter is shaped. I, I, in Proverbs 24, uh, verse 16, it says that a righteous man falls seven times. A righteous man, one who walks perfectly in line with God, falls seven times and rises again. That's what uh, Jesus is doing with Peter here on the beach. He is calling Peter to rise again as the righteous man he is. But Peter is also being restored in his call. Peter is restoring Peter, uh, his, Jesus is restoring Peter's missional identity, the things he was called to do. Peter's just gone back to his former occupation and Jesus is saying, no, remember what I've called you to do. Feed my lambs, Peter. I've called you. I'm going to build my church upon you, Peter. And then the restoration of Peter ends with this kind of odd prophecy where Jesus in verse 18 says, Truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Which is a strange way to wrap up this great walk and talk he's just had with Peter. But uh, verse 19 says that he said this to show what kind of death he was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter's restoration as a lover of Christ, as one called by Christ to uh, work with him, to, to these good works that he's called him to, Peter's restoration is complete with this prophecy. And Jesus is prophesying, look, this is the death that, with which you will glorify me with. Which is, we might think is strange, but remember what Peter said earlier. Peter said, Jesus, I'll follow you unto death. Jesus is calling forth in Peter the things that was in his heart before he denied Christ and failed. P Jesus is reminding him, Peter, remember what's in your heart. You want to be a man who follows me to the end, even unto death. And he reminds him of that. He says, you will. You will be a man who follows me even unto death. And with that, the restoration is complete. So, as we pay attention, yes, both to the failures we see around us and people who hurt us, I think it's most important for us to pay attention to how we respond when we fail. Do we allow failure when we mess up, slip up, little failures and massive embarrassing failures, do we allow them to take us out? Do we take a few days off from our walks with God because we're embarrassed, ashamed, or think the deal's off and we're not in fact who we thought we were? And I would encourage us as people who are called to Christ, who remain in him, even through failure, failure that we would come near him as Peter did that we would get to Christ, doing whatever it takes to get to Christ. So when you do fail, when you realize that you've messed up, I would just simply encourage you, repent and repent quickly. Let that godly sorrow lead you to repentance because there's life and salvation and no regrets in there because that's what the gospel story is for us. It doesn't end with our failure. It didn't end with Peter's failure and it won't end with our failure. So as we close, I want us to pay attention to think about how we see Jesus responding to our failures. Do we see him as distant, cold, and uh, putting us in a timeout? Or do we see him as Peter encountered him as one who is drawing near to him, playful, happy to be with us, sharing a meal with us, bringing us back into fellowship and restoring us as people who love him and follow him and who are called to his purposes? So I hope that encourages you. As I'm going to pray as we close. Would you pray with me? Jesus, Jesus, we confess with our mouths, we love you. I love you, Jesus, and I receive your work over my life, over my failures, Lord, where I've messed up, where I've missed it, where I've embarrassed myself. I receive your work of your cross, atoning for my sin, and your resurrection, conquering our sin and death and our judgment. Lord Jesus, you are the victorious one, and we want to remain in you today even through failure. So I pray for my friends and for myself that we would be people who draw near to you, even when we mess up and fail. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and that the story doesn't end with our failure. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. I